So thank you for your invitation. It's a pleasure to be in this uh, extraordinary university. And uh, I also admire your punctuality. Uh, I see that we are starting exactly on time. It reminds me of the story of these two gentlemen that were in Scotland, in a very remote area in Scotland. And they were uh, very eager businessmen, eager to have the last news uh, of the financial times. So they are going in uh, the news uh, store and uh, they are asking, uh, Madame, could we have uh, the financial times? And the lady says, do you prefer today's financial times or yesterday's financial times? So they were quite surprised. They said, well, today would be OK. And they said, uh, gentlemen, if you want today's financial times, why don't you come back tomorrow? <laughs> <laughs> so punctuality is of the essence. Uh, I know that the rule here is to respond to questions. And you know, of course, uh, much better than I what are the issues that are uh, of great importance for you. And I, I could speak in the introductory exposition on many possible issues, including perhaps a word on the UK and, uh, and Europe, a word on the euro and what I call the success of the euro, a word on the crisis, you see a lot of things. So what I will do, if you permit, is to concentrate on what I would uh, qualify as titles of chapters, and then you will see what you prefer to see uh, better and understand better, perhaps taking into account the titles of the chapter. But I would like to say a word on something which is quite extraordinary. Why are the continental Europeans unanimously in favor of the UK to stay in Europe with all the others, the 27, and uh, why aren't we in the situation where we were in the time of uh, the UK knocking at the door and uh, the European, namely, I have to say, uh, very often uh, General de Gaulle, saying, no, 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 uh, we don't want the, the UK to get in. Uh, and you, you remember that the UK was knocking at the door several times, uh, of course, at the very beginning of the economic uh, uh, the creation of the EEC, uh, the, the UK was not in favor at all and uh, was considering, he was prob probably still in the position of Churchill. Do you remember Churchill being a fantastic advocate for um, the um, federation of the European states, uh, of the reconciliation between the old enemies, between in particular Germany, France. But uh, Churchill was in this speech he delivered in Zurich, he was very clearly saying, you have three powers in the world. You have the US, you have the British Empire, and you have Soviet Union. And the three big powers in the world should be the sponsors of this new alliance in continental Europe. So the, in the vision of, uh, of Churchill, of course, uh, the British Empire was not part of the, what was going on, uh, perhaps uh, according to his marvelous speech, obviously, because it's the speech which is the most inspiring in terms of creating United States of Europe. Uh, one has to read again the speech that he delivered again in 46 in the Zurich University. So after a number of events that proved to the UK government that all taken into account, uh, it was very important for the United Kingdom to be part of the European construction in the making. Uh, you had a first knocking at the door in August 9, 61, and a veto which was expressed by General de Gaulle uh, in 63, a second knocking at the door in 66, a new veto in 67. And then you had the real entry uh, of, uh, of the, uh, the UK in Europe uh, with, you know better now, of course, the succession of episodes that, uh, that happened uh, and history is still in the making. We don't know yet what will happen and uh, it is um, something which of course is of extreme importance, I would say, both for the UK and for Europe as a whole. But when I am reflecting on this very important and extraordinary factor that at a time the UK was not interested at all, 
then the UK wanted to reach in, to get in, and there was no unanimity of the European to accept the UK. Now we are in a situation which is rather strange, obviously, when the 27, as I said, are all in favor of the UK to stay without any exception. There is not a single voice that would say, after all, it's not bad that the UK leaves. And uh, the UK decides, or has decided until now. Again, we will see uh, <coughs> the uh, meditation of the parliament, meditation of all the uh, leadership, political leadership, the meditation of the people itself, of course, is of ex extreme importance, I have to say, and uh, we will see again. I think that the, the last word is not yet there. But the reason why, it seems to me, there is unanimity of the other partners, of the other friends, uh, member of the 28, still today, uh, are uh, numerous. I see, of course, and I always insist on that personally, the UK is considered, rightly so, of being the sanctuary of representative democracy. I don't insist on that. It's clear. It's documented. It is history. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, at a time of growing populism, at a time of uh, challenging for uh, our democracies, uh, the fact that the UK is the sanctuary of representative democracy is something which is very important. It's one of the component, one of the dimension of this unanimity for uh, welcoming the UK and uh, being uh, saddened, very saddened by the uh, UK living. A second dimension is because the UK is also one of the sanctuary of the civil liberties of habeas corpus, uh, Bill of Rights, and so forth. There, of course, it is a little bit disputed by the US and by, and by the, the French, but it is true <laughs> that the UK has uh, there a sanctuary, is there a sanctuary of, uh, of uh, liberties. And, and that is very, very important too in a period where, obviously, uh, again, uh, in the advanced economy, popularism, populism is, uh, is impressive. And in the emerging world, and many citizens here are uh, of the emerging world, authoritarian regimes are there also. And this is a new set of challenges, both in the advanced economy and in the emerging economy. A third dimension, very important too, is that the UK is also a sanctuary of uh, market economics. Uh, the Industrial Revolution uh, was born here, and uh, the reflection, meditation on uh, the economic, uh, economic policy, uh, economies in general, economics in general, is uh, very, very uh, profound uh, in, this, in this country, historically and today. So that's, that makes uh, three dimensions, I would, I would say the sanctuary dimension, that uh, explain perhaps uh, this uh, unanimity I was mentioning. There is another dimension which seems to me very important, and what is surprising is that it is not perceived by the UK itself. It is the necessity for Europe to be at the level in terms of uh, dimension, in terms of economic dimension, also perhaps in terms of strategic dimension, uh, at the level of the constellation of the competitors. Uh, after World War II, there was only one partner, which was at the level of, uh, of uh, the European in the making, which was the United States of America. In a way, you had also Soviet Union. It's, uh, of course, a different case. but. When we reflect today on the world, we have a new constellation of uh, uh, powers, of, I would say in some respect, of single market with a single currency, like India, China, Brazil, Mexico, Indonesia, and the like. And uh, uh, as you know, it goes very, very fast. So in a way, uh, the European, in my opinion, have an additional reason to think that in this new world, which is changing so rapidly that the dwarfing, for instance, of the G7, the dwarfing of the small club of uh, uh, advanced economy is uh, incredibly impressive over time. We see by, by the year the percentage of GDP, or global GDP, 
which is uh, in, uh, in the hands of the G7, diminishing, diminishing, diminishing. And uh, of course, uh, as a consequence, uh, the share of the emerging countries, the, the new, what I was, was calling the new com constellation of very big uh, markets and very big uh, countries, is ve very uh, uh, striking. So it's, it's an additional reason that explains perhaps that the idea of the other European is that with the UK we are more comprehensive, more influential. Uh, without the UK we remain of course a very big set of countries, of economies. Uh, we are uh, larger uh, by population than the US, we are uh, larger by trade than the US even without the UK. Still of course with the UK uh, it would be more commensurate to the challenges of the new world in which uh, we are called to, to live. And I would say, of course, also that uh, there is uh, something which is very profound and which, of course, might be explained by all what we said, but which is more complex. And I will give you uh, some um, figures because they are striking. It seems to me that uh, in the UK in particular, and perhaps even uh, in, in Oxford, uh, one might have the sentiment that uh, all taken into account, populism, which is obvious in all advanced economies, say this uh, blend of uh, protectionism, uh, anti-immigrant, uh, anti-establishment, anti-globalization, that we see in the US, we see in the UK, we see in continental Europe, is uh, seen from the UK directed not only against the uh, national institutions, against the national governments, against the national parliament, but also against uh, the uh, Europe as a whole, which is the case in the United Kingdom. And uh, I will show you, perhaps, I hope, demonstrate that it is not the case in the other uh, countries, in the other members of the EU. And that is something which uh, I, I trust is bizarre, obviously. But look, the figures are the following. In the last Eurobarometer, it is the survey which is regularly organized by uh, the European, namely by the Commission, uh, but every six months we have the same questions which are asked and we can take it as something which is interesting uh, to the extent, of course, that it is repeated regularly. When we ask the question, do you trust your national parliament? The response which are appalling is trust 35% in the 28, so including the UK, no trust 58%. In the euro area, trust 37, no trust, 57. You see a big rejection by a differential of 20, 23 percent. The UK is exactly alike. Trust, 33 percent in the UK parliament, in the, the mother of all parliament, and no trust, 57 percent. So a, more or less the same uh, rejection, of an absence of trust. Let's not say rejection, absence of trust. Government, national government. Uh, 28, 35 trust, 59 no trust, same as for the parliament. Euro area 36, 59, more or less same as for the parliament also. UK 32% trust, 60% no trust. So exactly the same attitude. What we call populism, which is a, a too simple uh, form, uh, formula for frustration of a large part of our fellow citizens is the same when applied to the national institutions in practically all countries and I guess that you could say in all advanced economy. In the US it would be the same even perhaps a little bit worse for the Congress when you look at the, at the figures but I don't want to, bore, to bother you too, too much with that. The big difference is with the EU institutions. Then, if I take the European Parliament and the European Commission, I have more trust than no trust, paradoxically, because it is not, I guess, what you are reading regularly in the articles that are published here, but it is 
48 trust in the EU, 39 no trust. In the EU area, 49 trust, 40 no trust. And in the UK, only 33 trust and 44 no trust. So it, it is clear there is a significant difference, absolutely clear. And uh, it is the same for the European Commission. And in comparison with the uh, national government, you see, we have in the UK something which looks like the same rejection of the European institutions as is the case for the national institution, not in the other continental countries. And of course, that might explain why nobody is rejoicing on the continent that the UK is leaving, because uh, if, if they were uh, frustrated by the uh, European institution, as are the UK citizens, then they would probably say the first departure, OK, and then we will uh, try, we too, to uh, destroy or dismantle the uh, European Union. So there is a big, big difference. And of course, uh, one of the questions, but uh, I promised uh, not to be too long, so I see already uh, my, uh, our president looking at me with uh, some um, fear that I would be too long. <laughs> but I would say a very important question that you might like to ask me <laughs> about would be why? Why is there that difference? And why is it wrong when in the UK to think that the Europe is rejected by the U continental European as it looks like it is uh, by uh, the UK. And again, I'm not referring to the referendum. I'm referring to surveys that are asked regularly and permit a comparison which, in my opinion, has uh, uh, a lot of uh, credibility. So, uh, important question, but I don't respond to the question. I ask the question to myself and maybe you will give me an occasion of responding to the question I am asking to myself. <laughs> now, let me uh, also mention, I said that uh, I would say a word on the EU. I want only to say you, and these are, again, title of chapter. If you are interested in, I will respond. The euro is obviously in comparison with all the expectations uh, of many, many observers, and particularly, of course, out of uh, continental Europe, out of the Euro area, out of Ireland. Uh, when I say continental Europe, you have to understand continental Europe plus Ireland, of course. Uh, but uh, what, uh, what is uh, an incredible success is that we were told that we would not create a credible currency because uh, you could not have a credible currency when you were merging currencies that had uh, a very, very important credibility, a very important creditworthiness, if I may, uh, historically, and currency that had no credibility and no creditworthiness. And so the idea was you will have some kind of average. Cannot be a credible currency, cannot be a currency which will hold. And as you know, the euro hold even in the worst possible circumstances. The euro area, the same, a uh, number of uh, anticipation, particularly after Lehman Brothers collapse uh, and after the Greek problems and all the uh, sovereign risk problem we had to cope with in Europe, the idea was, of course, the euro area will explode. You, you, it will be dismantled because you cannot imagine that a construction which is so artificial will hold in the worst financial crisis since World War II, which could have been the worst financial crisis since World War I. To make a long story short, we were 15 members of the Euro area at the moment of the collapse of the bankruptcy of Lehman Brothers, 15 September 2008. At the moment I'm speaking, how many are we? We were 15 at that moment. The crisis started, the crisis in its uh, drama, in its, uh, uh, I would say, peak, uh, started at that moment. And I will surprise you, I don't ask the question really because I know that it's difficult and again, it's not very often communicated by uh, observers, articles uh, and so forth, but we are 19. The 15 that were in the Euro area are still in the Euro area, including Greece, and four new countries came in the Euro area after the bankruptcy of Lehman Brothers and after all the drama that we had to cope with in uh, Europe in terms of uh, 
a sovereign risk crisis. So you see, these are things that are important. And I conclude on that, if you permit. I would also say, in terms of growth, I, I'm sure that you are absolutely convinced, because it is in the air, that growth, real growth in the euro area, has been uh, miserable in comparison with the US. And it's not really true. Uh, in the, if you compute, of course, growth per capita, because it's a very important uh, element that uh, one has to take into account, to the extent that the uh, dynamism of population is uh, very superior in the US as uh, it, well, what it is in Europe, uh, we are, over all the period of the euro, the uh, rate of growth, average rate of yearly rate of growth is approximately the same in the US and in the euro area. 1.1, 1.2, it's not a real significant difference. It's not good for the euro area because, of course, we are late on the US uh, standard of living, we are late on the US GDP per capita, but it is something which, uh, again, should not be neglected also. There is there a sentiment to, I would say, downgrade, more or less, uh, the European and uh, particularly, of course, uh, the EU and the euro area, which is uh, not, uh, as you just see, fully justified. Of course, I'm not uh, suggesting that everything is uh, marvelous. We have a lot of hard work to do, a very, very, very hard work to do in the EU, in the euro area, whether the UK is in or not. And uh, I could also elaborate on the hard work to do if you ask me questions on that. Now, as you see, I did not mention the crisis itself, only to have some kind of uh, dates as regards uh, uh, other elements that I, was, uh, that I was explaining. So again, if any questions on the crisis and on what happened at the time of the global financial crisis uh, and of the uh, all elements, all dimension of the crisis, I stand ready to respond. I thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, that was very interesting. Um, I'm going to open it up to questions from the audience soon, but before that I just have a couple questions myself. To begin with, I wanted to talk about the adoption of the euro. Some have said that the euro was doomed from the beginning because it involved a single currency without a single fiscal and financial policy. Do you think that the lack of a unified fiscal policy means that Europe isn't able to manage its economic affairs adequately? I mean, we, are, uh, uh, we have embarked on history in the making. Nobody could say that the United States of America, starting the thing, uh, had a blueprint which was uh, a fantastic blueprint permitting uh, for them to know in advance all what they would have to do. So uh, it's true that uh, we learned by doing since the very beginning of the Euro. Still, I mentioned something which is uh, challenged very often. Uh, but seems to me extremely important. The fact that we had no fiscal federation, no fiscal uh, budget, uh, I mean, no federal budget, was known from, from the very beginning. And that's the reason why we created the, the Stability and Growth Pact. The Stability and Growth Pact is exactly the quid pro quo to take into account the fact that we uh, had a single currency, but no federation, political federation, and uh, fiscal federation. The fact that uh, the Stability and Growth Pact has been challenged by many, including inside the euro area, and by many economists outside the euro area, was, in my opinion, plain wrong, obviously. And I had myself to fight against this idea that uh, we could have a single currency without having some kind of framework as regards the fiscal policy. And my, my first speech in the European Parliament uh, immediately after having been appointed, it was in December 2003, was to say the Stability and Growth Pact is crucial for the cohesion of the euro area. Now, as I said, we, uh, we learned by doing since the very beginning, and we only to list the new concept that were decided 
at uh, the light of the experience, at the light of the crisis, at the light of the financial crisis, also at the light of the uh, sovereign risk crisis, we reinforced the Stability and Growth Pact. We had a new treaty for that. A treaty is something which is not easy, uh, as you know, and uh, there was a new treaty, which uh, we sim oversimplify in qualifying it as a fiscal compact. We uh, don't, so reinforcement of the fiscal policy, creation of a new pillar for governance of the euro area, which is called the Macroeconomic Imbalance Procedure, MIP, as important, in my opinion, as the SGP is. We created a uh, uh, banking union, which is something of extreme importance, the most important reform in Europe after the euro, after the single currency itself, is certainly this banking union. We created a mechanism which uh, is called the uh, European Stability Mechanism, ESM. I will I said that I would, I'm sure I will surprise you in saying that we came from 15 countries at the time of uh, Lehman Brothers up to 19 today, four new countries uh, getting in after the crisis. Uh, I will surprise you also because the callable capital of the ESM is something like 700 and, in my memory, 5 billion euros. So that makes the callable capital of that institution, which is a euro area institution, the most important callable capital on a of any multilateral institution in the world. So uh, again, I mentioned things. We, it's history in the making. We, did not, uh, we were not immobile in the recent period. And as you know, uh, things have to be completed. The, the uh, banking union is not yet fully completed. And of course, we have capital market union, which is also a program of extreme importance, which has to go further. And I have myself additional suggestions, like a minister of economy and the ministry of economy of the euro area, uh, like uh, the last word being given to the European Parliament. So it seems to me that we have to look at the European construction as something which is uh, an endeavor, a historic endeavor, and I regret very much that it's difficult to convince <laughs> my UK friends of that. It's a historic endeavor which has to be judged over a long period of time. I mean, the concept started uh, two-thirds of a century ago. Uh, of course, it's not finished, and of course, it has to be judged uh, not uh, in saying, oh, there is a, a big problem now, there is a big problem there, in thinking that it means that it will evaporate and be dismantled. No, uh, we have to reflect on the two-thirds of a century that are ahead of us, not only those who are behind us. And uh, again, this is, in my own understanding, a historic process of extreme importance based upon the overall lessons learned by the European, but which is more justified today than it was ever before because of the global changes, because of the fact, as I said, that we have now a constellation of enormously different uh, entities that are the emerging countries taking their place, rightly so, in the new world. Mm. So given that, but also given that there is a lot of dissatisfaction with the Euro, across Europe. Do you think that the way forward for Europe should involve more integration, less integration, or is it a bit more complicated than that? Again, we will do what the people will decide to do. As I mentioned, we had two new treaties which were deemed impossible to negotiate before the crisis, but with the crisis we had two new treaties. You said something which is important. You said to the extent that there are frustration against the euro or whatever. I'm sorry to say, it's exactly the contrary. The same, I could give you the figures if you wish, but the same euro barometer is giving the euro, uh, I would say, approval of the sentence. Do you approve a single currency for, uh, for the uh, European? Uh, 74%. And to understand why, not only the euro area was not dismantled, but why four new countries came in after Lehman Brothers bankruptcy, I think you have to take into account that all the countries that had the euro have their people calling to stay in the euro. 
And uh, it is particularly striking in the case of Greece, because Greece would have had all reasons to say, we do not like going back to a balanced budget, a balanced current account that uh, you know, many were calling abominable austerity. We don't want that, so we leave. And it was not at all what the uh, Greek fellow citizens said. They said, in any case, we want to stay. So uh, I will surprise you, uh, when, when the, you ask the German, a lot of German citizens are probably there, I, I could check that. <laughs> when you ask them, uh, do you approve that sentence, uh, the euro, the single currency for the European? 81% of the German. When, when I was in the turbulences of the crisis myself, in the turmoil of the crisis, and I was discussing with some US friends, they were telling me, one, the Greek will leave because they don't want austerity, full stop. Second, the German will leave because they are fed up with the uh, club med and they will go back to the DM. But it was plain wrong in both cases because the people didn't want to go along these uh, lines which appeared full of rational, <laughs> you know, seen from <laughs> a long distance say, seen from New York, but it was, it was not the reality. The reality is much more attachment to the currency in particular than is suspected, I think. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to quiz you on the figures or anything. Yeah. Uh, looking a bit back, you've been criticised for prioritising price stability in the aftermath of the Great Recession. Do you think you were right to keep interest rates high during that time? It's a very, very important question. When I reflect on what we did, my colleagues and I, and uh, of course uh, I was the leader, I see clearly that there were two major dimensions when we were in the crisis. One dimension was don't put in question, in the eyes of the fellow citizens of Europe, the fact that the institution, the ECB, is profoundly attached to price stability. Because, as I said, the, the expectations was they will not make it. It's impossible because, again, we are merging the DM, the Gilder, to oversimplify, and also the uh, Escudo, uh, the Dragma, and so forth. So the mixture is necessarily a currency which is not credible and a currency which accumulates uh, inflation, is losing its value over time and so forth. And that was, unfortunately at the time, uh, the sentiment of many, even in Europe, even in the Euro area, and particularly for part of the fellow citizens in the Euro area that had the difficulty to imagine that we could really uh, be the good gu guardian of the currency. So that was one. And clearly it was, in my own perception and the perception of my colleagues, a very important dimension. Second, we were in a dramatic crisis. And in a dramatic crisis, there was a second dimension, which was to be as bold and swift in order to cope with the, I would say, unfolding of events that were the most dramatic since World War II. To give you an example, I decided with my colleagues in the 9th of August 2007, at the time of the subprime, when we had a money market which was under attack, namely no more money market functioning in the euro area, uh, I decided with my colleagues that we would give liquidity to all our uh, economy without any limit. And we were asked 95 billion euros. It was a premiere. We gave 95 billion euros. It was considered incredible, uh, seen by all the observers. And it was heavily criticized, very heavily criticized by some, as too bold. I am in, in the UK. I was made a Financial Times Man of the Year because of that decision. I need to mention that at times we were considered extremely bold. And we were also extremely bold when, after Lehman Brothers, we generalized the uh, overall uh, full allotment at fixed rate, which is still there in Europe. I was also very heavily criticized, I have to say, with my colleagues, when we purchased Greek treasuries, Irish treasuries, uh, Portuguese treasuries, uh, which was a premiere 
in 2010, and we purchased uh, Italian treasuries and Spanish treasuries in 2011. So that was considered absolutely abnormal. Uh, it was a premiere, obviously, much too bold, much too uh, abnormal, much too non-conventional. You see, there are the two dimensions. So some were saying, not the same, of course, were saying uh, you are orthodox, and others were saying you are totally unorthodox. And my, my understanding is that it, it we considered, I considered at the time, that was the right way to proceed. All that being said, had we been dramatically pro-orthodox, it seems to me that the average inflation since the setting up of the euro, which was when I left something like 2% or even a little bit more as an average, yearly average inflation, since the setting up of the euro up to end of 11 when I left. And when you look at it until now, then you have something, if I'm not misled, of 1.75%. Some of you perhaps have made all the computation. So when we were mentioning the fact that the benchmark, the yardstick to measure what we were doing was less than 2%, but close to 2%, I would say uh, over 20 years, 1.75% is not necessarily a bad result. Not too orthodox, not miserably, uh, uh, I mean, we are not at 1%, we are not at 0.5, fortunately. Uh, I accept fully that anything that you do can be criticized. But I will surprise you, in Europe, I've been much more criticized for the bold and swift and very bold measures that I take myself and that my successor has taken uh, which were different but adapted to, to the cases than uh, for having been too orthodox. I'd love to keep going, but I'm keen to open it up to the audience now. <coughs> so just put your hand up. A uh, microphone will come to you. Stand up when you're asking the question. Um, first off, we'll go just here in the aisle. Thank you for your speech. Um, I was wondering, what do you think about the current sovereign debt levels uh, in Europe and in the world more generally? I am worrying a lot. Uh, at the global level, it seems to me that the most, uh, I would say, dangerous uh, behavior and the most uh, abominable observation that we can make is that the overall public and private debt outstanding as a proportion of global GDP has continued to augment after the crisis approximately at the same pace as before the crisis, which is hard to believe because <coughs> everybody recognizes that one of the major dimension of the crisis that we had to cope with in 07, 08 and after was precisely the level of leverage at a global level, level of leverage, particularly at the level of the advanced economy. So the only difference between before the crisis and after the crisis are the following. Before the crisis, we had uh, a contribution of global leverage, again measured by global public and private debt outstanding on global GDP, which was contribution was com coming uh, to the extent of approximately 90% from the advanced economy and 10% for the emerging economies. After the crisis, the proportion became 50-50, meaning that the advanced economy had diminished by approximately a factor two, their own contribution to the overall uh, uh, public and private debt outstanding, which still remains substantial, but the pace of course, of accumulation is much less than before the crisis. But it means that the emerging economies have multiplied by five their own contribution to the uh, leverage, global leverage. And uh, uh, all have uh, contributed. There are, of course, contributions which are higher than others because the size of the economy is uh, much higher. China is a case in point. But all taken into account, as you see, if I take it, and I really trust that it is true, of course, that there is a pertinent entity which you can call global, the global economy, then 
if there is such a pertinent entity taking into account all the interleakages that exist and all the, I would say, uh, uh, capacity, as we could see, that for contagion to be uh, generalized and extremely swift and, and rapid, if it is the case, then we are living today in a global economy which, which might prove to be as dangerous, if not more dangerous, than it was the case in 07, 08. All that being said, of course, I don't suggest that uh, uh, it will happen tomorrow or the day after tomorrow, but I'm suggesting that if we do not change our course of action, and I'm speaking of all economies in the world, and including, of course, the advanced economy, we, will, we might put ourselves in very, very dangerous situations. And I, I cannot imagine what would be the reaction of our fellow citizens if we had twice the kind of crisis we had to cope with previously. <coughs> A lot, the amplification of the frustration of our fellow citizens, not only in the advanced economy, but also in the emerging economies, would be absolutely gigantic. So I it's urgent, it's time to control this augmentation of leverage. Okay. Uh, another question then. How about over here in the blue? Yeah. yeah. Thank you very much for the talk. Um, you said earlier the euro is crucial for cohesion in Europe, and it is part of a greater integration program. However, the euro has been favoring certain countries over others repeatedly. Throughout the euro crisis, Germany kept up a 50 billion euro debt within Europe alone while other countries had deficits, Portugal, Greece, Malta, Italy. Germany had profited over 2.9 no, billion pound euros from Greece after bailing them out in interest. Germany has been manipulating the currency internationally, as the US has pointed out and China has pointed out on several occasions. So to what extent is the euro actually a European currency as opposed to a German one in European clothes? And why isn't the ECB monitoring this and making it um, better for everyone? I will surprise you by some figures. <laughs> when, when I was myself president, it is in 05, I was, I was uh, appointed at the end of 03. It was in 05 that I was convincing myself that our main problem was not to deliver price stability, which we could do, but was to observe persistent divergences uh, in the euro area. And I was calling permanently the, the ministers in the euro group. I was participating in all the Europe meetings of uh, ministers of finance with figures that were very simple. Augmentation year after year of wages and salaries in the public service in euro, of course, because we were in the euro area. We all had the same currency, same international purchasing power, same international cost, same currency. And that particular indicator was the following from the start of the euro up to end of year 09. You end of, of 09 means the start of the sovereign risk crisis. Augmentation in Greece, 117%. Augmentation in Ireland, more than 100%. Augmentation in, say, Portugal, something like 74%, 75%. In Spain, 70%. In Germany, augmentation in euro of the wages and salaries in the public service, 20%. Average in the euro area as a whole, 36%. So you see, the discovery was that spontaneously, you could have a lot of difference of behavior uh, in the same single currency area and uh, that was not spontaneously corrected 
by the normal functioning of market economies. Normally, you would have expected, and that was what was more or less foreseen at the beginning of the euro, that if an economy was losing competitiveness, uh, progressively, it would correct it, its loss of competitiveness because it would translate in many problems for the firms, for the enterprises, uh, for, for unemployment. But it was not what we observed. Of course, the you, you could say the surplus countries were financing much too easily the uh, countries in deficit and the countries that were augmenting wages and salaries and unit labor costs, because I mentioned only the civil service, because for me it was very important to be able to tell the ministers, you're responsible for that. Don't tell me that it is the ma market economy which is functioning spontaneously. It is the decision that you're taking yourself, because we are speaking of the wages and salaries of the, uh, of the civil service. But uh, what happened, again, was that you had enormous divergences enormous divergences of current account, national current account. For instance, Greece, uh, when the uh, explosion of the crisis hit Greece, the current account deficit was 15% of the GDP. Uh, the current account of, uh, of Portugal was 10%, uh, minus 10% of the GDP of Spain, minus 9.5%. You see, you, you had enormous uh, elements of divergences. And this should have been corrected. But you can, of course, say it's the fault of all the others. Uh, it's the fault of the private sector, which was continuing to finance without looking at the risks that were at stake. It's the, the, the fault of the banks. It's the fault of the, uh, you know, it's f the fault of everybody. So the problem is uh, to avoid putting yourself in such a new situation. And I mentioned um, a moment ago, the fact that the, 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 a new pillar for uh, economic governance inside the euro area had been created in the crisis, and that new pillar is the macroeconomic imbalance procedure, uh, which is supposed to look at the loss of competitiveness or the exceptional, abnormal gain of competitiveness of countries. And the only point where I will join you, of course, is that this should function symmetrically and we should be able, the, the institutions of Europe should be able to, to tell a country which is posting an enormous amount of current account surplus, there is something which does not work correctly in your economy. Clearly, the domestic demand is too weak, and you have means to activate the domestic demand. The most simple mean uh, is augmentation of wages and salaries in the countries that, have, uh, that are posting an enormous uh, amount of extra competitiveness. In principle, it is the way uh, the system should function now with the MIP, the Macroeconomic Imbalance Procedure, and uh, the combination with the other, I would say, very important pillars of governance. But you see, uh, when you look at everything, it's very difficult to have a uh, scapegoat. Uh, it is the system which uh, we have discovered, exactly like in the US, at a certain moment, you discover that you trusted market economies and you trusted that uh, uh, there was a, a very good theory of uh, a market being always uh, perfectly optimal or close to the optimum. And then you realize that uh, it was a wrong hypothesis. Uh, clearly, uh, we had, uh, at the very beginning, and it we, we would have had a better behavior, of course, to have also this macroeconomic imbalance procedure. It is what I had called for since precisely, as I said, uh, 2005. 2005, every month, be, be careful, we are documenting persistent divergences in terms of competitiveness and in terms of current account uh, uh, imbalances uh, since the, the beginning of the euro. Another question, um, just right at the back in the aisle. Bonsoir, Monsieur. Merci d'être venu. Um, I read that um, your father knew well um, the ex-president of Senegal, um, Leopold Senghor. And extrapolating from this fact, I was wondering how you perceive the actual um, economical state of Senegal. Thank you. 
That's a very nice question. Yes, indeed. And I had the privilege myself to be close to, to Leopold Sedar Senghor. And because I am in England, I can say it was a, he was a genius with a, a perfect uh, uh, mastering of uh, his own, of course, uh, language uh, in Senegal, uh, in his own uh, particular uh, extraordinary uh, clever environment. He, he, he was the man I, I would say, consider the most intelligent I ever encountered. And uh, he was also reflecting on the English poetry. I discovered that when he was, he was about to enter the Académie Française uh, for his own poems and his own books, uh, he told me, and I was absolutely amazed, that he uh, was working on uh, the British poetry, but that he was very struck because he discovered that finally the heart of the British poetry was Celtic poetry. And so he was mentioning a number of uh, poets that were from Ireland, Scotland, Wales, and uh, that were, in his opinion, at the art, uh, at the very heart of, uh, of uh, I would say, uh, creative poetry and uh, imaginative and creative poetry. And he was even saying, you know, he was more or less the inventor of negritude, la negritude with others, but, uh, but he was uh, fully assuming that. And he was even going up, taking <laughs> into account the British, the uh, UK case. Uh, there is in the Celticude something <laughs> which is close to negritude. So uh, I'm sorry, because I, I, don't, I cannot be very pertinent on um, the economy of, uh, of Senegal in particular. O all what I can say is that uh, in sub-Saharan Africa, we have observed during the recent years, a capacity to grow. And it's true both, I would say, in the uh, Francophone and in the Anglophone sub-Saharan African country, something which is, even if you have problems here and there, but the, the capacity of these uh, economies to grow per capita, which you know, 10 years ago was considered so difficult that practically impossible, they could prove several years that it was possible. So, uh, and for all, for all of us European, uh, the African development is absolutely fundamental. Absolutely fundamental. You know that growth, demographic growth, comes from Africa in the years to come, and no, no more from Asia. So it's a, it's a challenge which is absolutely gigantic. We should have time for one more question, and for that we'll go right over here. Yeah, the one standing up. <laughs> right. uh, my question has got to do with um, European banks. Um, so, over the last decade, uh, credit, been, credit has been fairly cheap, and now with interest rates uh, beginning to rise, what's your point of view on how this might affect uh, cre credit quality at European banks, um, especially s uh, since there are some murmurings about a potential merger between Deutsche and Commerce Bank and whether that might potentially affect things? Well, uh, first of all, when reflecting on the European banks, one has to realize at the very beginning of the crisis, the European banks were financing nine, uh, seven, uh, 75% of the European economy. The American banks only 25%. Markets, we are financing 75% of the US economy and only 25% of the European economy. So uh, we, we are in a universe, it's a little less the case, but still, uh, we are in a universe in Europe where banks are very important. And that's the reason why at the very beginning of the crisis, I mentioned myself this idea of uh, full allotment at fixed rate, giving liquidity to all banks without limit, which is still the case in Europe today and was never uh, done in the US. It's not, the US concentrated very much, as you know, on the market liquidity, uh, on the purchase of tradable securities, private and public, in order to give liquidity to the market as uh, much as possible because it was their problem. A drama in the US is when the market liquidity evaporates. That's absolute drama. 
the drama in Europe is when the banks cannot make any loan anymore because the uh, liquidity of the banks has evaporated. So that being said, my uh, understanding, a uh, second comment, of course, uh, which is very important, is that we have now a banking union. And the paradox of the euro area, in some respect, and European Union as a whole, uh, in many respects, is that we have still a number of, uh, I would say, hurdles that not do not permit restructuring and reshaping at the level of Europe as a whole as we should and as is possible, uh, certainly in the United States of America and in a normal uh, single market with a single currency. So there, there we still have difficulties which are due to prudentials and prudentials at the level of uh, each and every nation. And that is something which uh, has certainly to be, to be reflected upon. Now, there is an anomaly in some countries where you would expect a flourishing industry in this domain as well as in all others. Uh, Germany is a case in point. Normally, Germany, with this uh, flourishing economy and remarkable uh, industry and uh, service uh, sector, should have uh, a very vibrant uh, banking sector. But it's not the case for a number of reasons that are very, very complex and associated with the fact that uh, still some, uh, some um, uh, banks uh, that have a large market share are not too interested in uh, making appropriate uh, profits. So that, that creates uh, something which is uh, bizarre. It exists also in other countries. And again, uh, certainly the banking sector, the achievement of the banking union, and as I said already, the capital market union are uh, workshops of extreme importance in Europe, and uh, I would very much encourage, of course, the European to, to work much more actively and decisively mm -hmm. in this domain. Thank you very much, Mr. Fouché. That was incredibly interesting. Everyone, please join me in thanking. <laughs> <laughs>